Good morning, everyone at home. Welcome to our third week of our Uncommon Christmas. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are going to be celebrating through song today, through the word, and through a story of peace, even in the midst of anxiety. So we just pray that God would meet with you this Sunday as we sing these songs together. So come and join us now. Thank you, Joanna. It is good to be with you today, albeit virtually and two-dimensionally, but we're delighted to join with you wherever you happen to be, if it's your living room or your office. I'm envisioning uh, wherever you are, this awesome opportunity to be able to sing and declare trust in the living God together with us. And so from where you are, it's, it's like this beacon of light just sort of shooting up from there, that location, that location, another one, another one, and all around from wherever we happen to be watching. Let's lift up the praises to the living God. Even if it feels a little strange to be doing that by yourself, know that you're not by yourself entirely. We're connected right now. And uh, in the presence of the living God, let's pour out our praises and our prayers.
Well, over this Advent season, we have been uh, sharing various stories from people who are talking about uh, challenges and difficulties through this last season. And we've been blessed by that because we're talking about God meeting them in hopefulness and giving them light and life. And today, we get to hear from Liam Fleming. Good morning, church. For me, the season of leading up to Christmas never seems to feel peaceful. As a student, the chaos of school concluding for the semester brings up all kinds of questions and concerns. As someone who works retail, I'm constantly bombarded with questions. Anxiety seems to permeate every aspect of my life, and I find myself easily and quickly overwhelmed. This is a poem entitled Self-Interrogation. I'm going to ask some questions out loud, questions I ask myself, some more often than not. Is that all right? Is my phone on silent? Why not double check? Have I had enough water today? What about veggies? Did I lock my car? It wouldn't hurt to lock it again. Or maybe maybe again, I didn't hear it go off that time. Am I being that person, the, the annoying person in the parking lot? Did I leave the kitchen light on? How about the oven? Do I really remember hitting off? Did I eat breakfast this morning? Why does brex- breakfast make me feel so nauseous? Is it because I haven't been getting enough sleep lately? How long am I going to stay up to do my work? How long am I going to put off doing my work? How long am I going to stay in bed? Am I lovable? Am I enough? Is what I'm doing enough? What is my five-year plan? Do people respect me? Will I ever earn the respect of the older generation? Will I ever be a good enough leader for the young? Am I the bad example? How long until they abandon me? Am I forgiven? Will I be saved? Is it worthwhile to worry about any of these things? Is that all right? For me, the season leading up to Christmas never seems to feel peaceful, yet In the turbulence of my anxious thoughts, the Lord has been constant, consistent, and ever-present. When I remind myself to plant my feet on the rock, I can find rest. The Lord helps me find peace amongst the storms. Would you read this scripture passage from Isaiah with me? You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you, trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this new day, which is a fresh start. Amidst all that we encounter today, we begin by giving you reverence in our hearts and mind and body. We pray that you will be exalted throughout creation today and that your good intentions will be accomplished in and through us. You know the things that we need today, whether it's actual bread or many other things. Thank you for being our good provider. Thank you also for Liam's reminder right now that you offer us peace in the midst of turmoil. Thank you that you are God and that you are good. Please provide what we need today. Lord, also we pray that you would forgive us for our trespasses this past week. 
We know that we've walked into some areas that are none of our business to do so. And so please forgive us. And we hereby also forgive others who've trespassed against us. You see all and you know all and you are far more capable than we are to judge correctly with equal and correct measures of grace and truth. And so we entrust ourselves to you with thanksgiving. And amid all of the choices out there for us today, would you please lead us through your good paths? Would you fill us, Holy Spirit, from head to toe and empower us to do your will today? And finally, in this Advent season of waiting, in your mercy, would you deliver us from evil? We recognize that there are pitfalls and deceptions all around us. So would you be our wisdom and our shield so that we can participate with you and so that we can share your life and your light and your love to others. We pray these things with thanksgiving and hopefulness for it's your kingdom and your power and your glory forever and ever. Amen. Thy people free from our fears and sins, release us, let us fight our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, thou art dear desire of every nation, joy of every Yeah. Mm-hmm.
planted today. It's our prayer that around the world, you, Lord God, would be declared most high, most mighty, name above all names. And so we join in singing, Great are you, Lord. Good morning again. Just a couple of announcements for us this morning. First being that with our current provincial health order extension, we will be continuing to stay online gathering until at least January 8th. Um, and with that, Pastor Scott also wanted to say thank you for your prayers. He and his family have safely completed their quarantine time and are all healthy. So thank you for that. We do miss being together, but are really thankful for the ways that we can still connect together online. And with that, Christmas is almost here. And we will be having online services at 2, 4, and 11 p.m. this year. So as we all really need the hope of Jesus this Christmas, would you consider thinking about who you could invite to this event? Um, it'll be great. It'll be an uncommon, uncommon Christmas Eve service. And uh, now we've been doing about our Advent giveaways for the past few weeks. And I wanted to give you an update on last year's recipient before I tell you about this week. So last year, um, our partner, Arasha, we had raised money for them. And they actually just sent a thank you update to us. And they said that they were able to share um, the funds by providing healthy, sustainable food for isolated seniors, um, 14 new families in Canada. They were able to continue some of their programs with that, with that money in a safe um, way. So we just say thank you. And behind every initiative, every amount of money that we want to raise, 
ways. There are awesome people on the ground making it happen. So it's not just a thing, it's people that we're empowering to do impactful work in our community. And with that, this week, a lot of you know uh, who we're supporting, the people of Peace Portal Uganda. Pastor Michael and his church, they've been a longtime partner here, global partner with Peace Portal. And um, ever since the pandemic hit, they pivoted and they were able to help provide for the needs of the most vulnerable in their community. And this $10,000 goal that we're hoping to raise for them will go towards continuing on in that way. They're going to provide hampers, Christmas hampers, and help with food initiatives that will help those that are most vulnerable as well as some needed dental procedures for some of the kids in their community. So please give to that if you are able. And lastly, we also wanted to thank you for all the ways that you've been generous for our church body here in Peace Portal Ministries and the way you've enabled us to serve right now. Um, our year-end budget, we're still uh, in need of $254,000. So Think of the ways that God is calling you to give joyfully with our resources as we can multiply what he's doing and calling us to do in this community. So thank you for, for doing that already. Um, and as Jeff comes up, the most important question, just kidding, uh, is do you like artificial or real trees? Start the debate now in the chat as he comes up. Good morning. That is an, a very important question that's close to my heart, Joe. The real tree, we're a real tree family. We drag our family out into a simulated forest with a saw and chase down a tree. And of course, my kids didn't want to help. So we just got cold chasing down this tiny tree, but we have a real tree. If you have an artificial tree, we forgive you. But real tree is the answer. I have a question for you, everyone that's joining online. It's an awesome morning to be with you. Uh, my name is Jeff Stewart. I'm the pastor of youth and online. So normally I would be spending time with you this morning at the church online. But uh, this morning I have the great honor of uh, speaking. But I want to know this question. What was your most memorable Christmas gift? When you think about all the gifts you got as a kid, what was most memorable? It doesn't have to be expensive. It could even be when you were an adult. Something that was really meaningful that you think back and say, that, man, I just remember opening that gift. What was it? I'd love for you to say it in the chat, and I'm going to tell you a little story about mine. In 1990, I was eight years old. It was Christmas time, and uh, I was really hopeful about what could come for Christmas that year. And I'm sure I wanted toys. I'm sure I wanted a video game. And to date myself, it was probably a video game for my original Nintendo. So it might have been like Super Mario Brothers 2 or something like that, something really cutting edge. And uh, I remember the other thing I asked for was tickets to a concert. And so I remember Christmas morning, we'd opened up kind of all the gifts and we'd gone through everything. And my mom said, oh, wait, there's one more. What a classic. It was like, a, like an infomercial. Wait, there's more. And so my mom hands this envelope to my brother and I, and in it was tickets to this. The new kids on the block. And so some of you are like, new kids on the block, those guys are the best. You loved Step by Step. You loved Step by Step. I'm trying to think of what are the other songs other than Step by Step that everyone knew. Hanging Tough. Uh, new Kids on the Block was a movement for young people. When I, when I was eight years old, my first concert in February 1991 at the Pacific Coliseum. And I remember standing outside the Coliseum and we looked up. And if you've ever been to the Coliseum, there's like kind of like an office area in the luxury box area. And the, the glass looks out over the audience. And someone shouted, oh my goodness, there's Donnie. And Donnie Wahlberg being the most prominent, one of the most famous members of the New Kids on the Block. Uh, this is Donnie Wahlberg right here. The other ones are fairly inconsequential. But Donnie Wahlberg was definitely the one that everyone either liked or hated. And I remember looking up, someone said they thought they saw Donnie. It could have been the custodian. We didn't care. Everyone starts screaming. It was amazing. We had our homemade shirts on. We were just pumped. And I remember I had New Kids on the Block puzzles and New Kids on the Block magazines. I had a New Kids on the Block comic book, all of that stuff. But here's what Donnie was famous for. And every kid after this, I remember I, my parents were gracious enough and wise enough not to allow me to do this. But Donnie was famous for his haircut. And it was this one right here. The rat tail. And so if you were ever uh, cool enough to rock a rat tail, someone asked me if this was actually a photo of me, which it's not. And I could see all the telltale signs other than um, I have a little less hair back here now. That could have been a photo of me. But the rat tail haircut was the thing that came out of New Kids on the Block that really ruined culture for a little while. And all these little kids, little boys all over the country wanted to, wanted to grow them. I'm sure little girls wanted to, wanted to shave their head and have a beautiful rat tail growing down their back. 
And so I think about being a kid, and I think about the things that shaped me and shaped who I was and shaped how I dressed, shaped what I, what I thought, the, way that I, the things that I believed, the places that I went. And so what I want to talk about today and what we're going to talk about in this Uncommon Christmas series as I stand in front of this cactus is an idea of an uncommon identity. And so what I want to do today is we're going to look at the book of Galatians and we're going to talk about uh, the way that God helps us understand and through Paul's words to the the church in Galatia to understand what does it mean for us to have an identity that is rooted somewhere that is uh, not in culture, not in this world. And what are the dangers of doing that? And so a lot of things can really shape who we are. And so we find our identity is often rooted in things and friends that have influence over us our income, our connectedness, our work, our hobbies, or our politics. And things that um, oftentimes we're, our identity is shaped by things that we're good at or at least things that we perceive ourselves to be good at. And today we're going to talk about how our identity in this Advent season, we can um, embrace a way of being through Christ that is freeing, it is fulfilling, and offers so much more than the world has to offer. I'm going to read to you guys from the book of Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. And uh, I'm just going to pray before we do that. God, as we open up your word this morning, Lord, I just pray you to reveal yourself to us. God, there's so much richness in the text, but specifically as we look at this, God, would you speak to us, speak to our hearts. And God, would you challenge us uh, to think about how, God, you want to identify us, how you want to show us our value, our meaning, our purpose, and ultimately where our identity can and should be found. Lord, would you challenge us this morning where we've strayed? Would you challenge us this morning where we've attached ourselves and our lives to things that are not of you? Pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, If you're online, if you don't have a Bible in front of you, at the bottom there's a Bible tab and you can click on that and you can follow along in the book of Galatians and we'd love for you to be able to follow on and see where we're going. So, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Think of it this way. If, this is Paul trying to explain um, this idea to the church. He's trying to explain this. He says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. Even though they actually own everything their father had, they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's, and that's the way it was with us Uh, before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles, talking about the law of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves, slaves to the law, so that we could adopt, uh, sorry, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And now you are no longer a slave. This is important. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So what does it mean? This text is all about identity. And we think about what our own identity is. We often form it in really unhealthy ways for a lot of us. And I include myself in that group. We attach to temporary circumstances, movements, peoples, culture, and our own strengths and abilities and achievements. And the last nine months of COVID has meant a lot of loss for a lot of people. And that's been the common thing that I've heard people say is that I feel lost in this season. I feel lost And a lot of it has to do with the fact that when I talk to people, they say, the things that I used to do, I can't do anymore. And not realizing that so much of the things they do were tied to who they felt they were. That their ability to participate in something, their ability to do something, their ability to be a part of something, meant a loss in their identity. And that having that taken away and having, losing their ability to do those things meant that in this season, they've lost those things. Whether it was sports, a lot of people have experienced this, where they felt really involved, they felt really involved, they were participating, they were involved in a league, they played a game, and now all of a sudden they can't participate anymore. Travel, we have a lot of snowbirds in our church, and a lot of you would normally not even be here at this time of year, and you'd be traveling, or you might be, have planned a trip. My own family, we canceled several trips that we planned in the last nine months. For our grads, we canceled the grad trip. We, a lot of things that we plan to do that we find joy in, life in, identity in, in those places, and being a part of places. Being a snowbird is an identity piece. It's something that we would say is a part of us. And not losing that means that you feel, and I think many people feel like they've lost something. It could be business success. Your identity could be found in your success as a business owner, your success as an employer. I know for myself, one of the studies they've said is that people that lead like me, I I feel like when I lead people, I'm really good with people in the room. I feel like I can really roll with the punches. I I can really kind of manage in the situation. 
But people actually who are really logistically minded, who are really good at sending emails and delegating tasks super well, have risen up in this season as people like me, whose leadership style really struggles in a pandemic. My leadership style is not as successful in this. And the people who are organized, administrative, have, have, they're, they're just rising up in the ranks as the way that they lead in their style is more appropriate for an online setting, for working from home. And so for me, I've sensed a little loss of identity in how I lead. I love leading youth ministry. We haven't really had students in the building significantly since March. And so for me, I've sensed a loss of identity is I have attached my identity to my role as a youth pastor in an unhealthy way. And I've had to confront that. And this void that we talked about can be, as people maybe don't look at things that they're a part of, it actually is giving them a chance to look at their own past. And what I've, I want to say is that this, is while we talk about that your identity is not your work, your identity is not uh, in your successes, it is not in uh, the sports that you play, the places that you go, this season has invited for some people retrospection that has led them to believe lies about themselves. And I want to say this too. Your identity is not found in your failures. And nor is it found in your chemistry and your body and any of those places. It's not in your relational status, how many friends you have. It's not rooted in your marital status. When our identity is externally influenced, it is susceptible to external forces. And so Paul's words in Galatians 4, as we're really going to unpack them in a minute here, is all about where our identity is found. And it is not in our successes. It is not in our conditions. It is not in our relationships. It is not in our marital status. And it's certainly not in our bank accounts and our victories. When, we, when our identity is externally influenced, it is susceptible to external forces. And those external forces are temporary, seasonal. And when those forces are seasonal, temporary, and predicated on our work, our effort, and our success, they are bound to fail at some point. And Galatians 4, 6 really specifically tells us, and because we are his children, he sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba Father. He's saying that because of who God is and what he's done for us, that our identity defined by Christ is not external, but internal, that God is within us. And our, de- our, our identity is not defined by our successes. It's not by our victories. It's by Christ's victory. And the risk for us is that we can find our sense of identity changing constantly, and there's the big danger in that is actually it can compromise our mission. There's a theologian by the name of Miroslav Volf. And he makes a really important uh, description for us of this. He said, when we lack a solid sense of identity, when our identity is not rooted in Christ, when we lack identity, it can lead us to fear people that are different than us because we fear that they are going to either corrupt or disrupt our sense of identity. So he's arguing that actually the less, when our identity is not solidified in Christ, that we lead ourselves to a place where we fear other people and therefore exclude them because we're so worried that spending time with people that are different than us, think different than us, live different than us, spend their money different than us, do anything different than us, will corrupt us. That somehow we, instead of engaging with it and being saying, knowing who I am and why I am who I am and who God made me to be and what he's done for me, We unintentionally or intentionally exclude the other, which is in opposition to the mission of the church and his call for us to make disciples and for his call to love our neighbors and for us as the mission as a church. But for a lot of us, we we miss out on those things and we don't really even realize until they're taken away. The things that we've attached our identity to. A real quick story. Um, My wife is the brains of our operation in every way possible. Um, She is... Amazing. Her name's LaVon, if you don't know her. She's uh, a tax accountant. She's super smart, super great, and a better friend than me. She's better in basically every uh, capacity. But when she finished university, she was a really high achiever in university. And for her, when she finished, one of the things that she noticed was that she'd really attached a lot of her identity to getting good grades. Every semester, she'd work hard, and she'd be handed a report with her grades on it. GPA was high. You did great. And she said one of the things that she longed for when she finished university was she felt a sense of loss of affirmation through grading. And so one year for Christmas, I made LaVon a report card. And I made a report card about, uh, we were dating at the time, and I was like, how, you know, how are you as a girlfriend? How are you as like, call, you know, uh, talking to me on the phone? Uh, how are you at serving your family? And, and some other random things like golf. I, you know, we, her and I were golfing together. It was her only bad grade was golf. I gave her a B minus, and I said, they can't all be winners, and I wish we would golf more together. But for her, that filled that void for a moment. And it was a funny way to do it. But to understand that for all of us, there are things that we unhealthily attached our identity to. 
And that when they come to an abrupt halt or we can no longer do them, whatever it happens to be, actually we miss out on the fullness that God has for us because we've latched on and found ourselves in things that are not of God. They're not of him and they're not healthy. Let's, let's, let's unpack the text and just go through it verse by verse here and then we're going to focus in on two. Okay, chapter four, verse one. He talks about a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children. Those children are not, better, not much better off than slaves as they grow, um, until they grow up. So a father leaves his, his inheritance to his children. It makes sense. They're under guardianship. Until they're 18, they cannot receive the money that his father gave. So he's comparing them to slaves in the sense that they, as a slave is under the rule of their master. And for a child in the home, they are under the rule of their, their parent, or if their parent passes away, under the rule of a guardian. So he's saying, hey, we are like children where we have this inheritance, but we can't receive it yet because the time hasn't come for us to do that. So it's just a really interesting way to explain that. Verse number two, they have to obey their guardians until they reach the, whatever age they're father set. So in this case, age majority. And so for us, the, the, we sing the song, O come uh, thou long expected Jesus. There was generations that had passed expecting Christ's arrival. And so to understand that there was a waiting period, a long waiting period, generations passed, people's lives came and go expecting Christ to come. And when the time fully came for this child that was given its inheritance and had to wait until the time that was appropriate, this is the description Paul is using to help us understand it. And it was, that was the way it was before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. And so when he's saying, he's comparing slaves, the, the, it's, we got to be careful not to look at the law as some sort of like, tyrannical system. It was a system that worked and it functioned in the society and we were subject to it. And people were subject to the laws and how it worked and comparing them to slaves meant that they were under the rule of the law. That that was the way they had to live. And so that, that's the comparison he keeps making. Verse number four. But when, he, when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Important here, born of a woman. That is talking about Jesus, the incarnation. One of the, the, basically one of the most important pieces is to understand that Christ would come that he would live, he was born of a woman, and that he would come to life and know all its beauty on earth, its pain, its wonder, and its challenge. And so for us, verse five speaks, uh, verse four speaks to the incarnation. Verse five, God sent him to buy freedom for us who are slaves to the law so that he would adopt us into our own family. God would send Jesus to purchase our freedom and that he would adopt us into his family. I just want to focus here, and there's a few really important distinctions that we have here, and they're going to be up on the screen beside me. One, a son has a father, a slave has a master. And this is a really important distinction that he's trying to make, is that a son, as we become sons and daughters of God, as we're adopted into his family, we now have a father. A slave is an employee and has a master. Second, a son is driven by devotion. A slave is driven by duty. And that for a son to be loved, to love his father and devoted to his family, that we as sons and daughters adopted into God's family are devoted to him. That we love because we were loved. We care for those because of the example that Christ set for us. A slave is driven by duty. They are an employee. A son is rich. A slave is poor. There's a wealth to what God offers us and offers everybody. That he invites us into something bigger. And lastly, a slave is an employee and a child is an heir. An important distinction. That a slave is the employee of the master. And that's the way we were. But then we were adopted into the family and we become heirs to the kingdom. Heirs to what God is up to. Heirs to eternity. And verse 6 and 7 are where we're going to focus here for a minute. Verse 6 says this. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. We talk about things from the outside that influence us. We talk about things that shape us. And what is Paul's trying to get across is that the thing that must shape us the most is that which has been put in our heart by God. Our identity as being an adopted member of his family, our identity as being one of his sons and his daughters and his children. But not only that, that it's internal, that the spirit of God is within us and dwells amongst us. And then as a result, our identity is found in what God is doing in our lives and what he's done for us already. In verse seven, or sorry, just real quick, I'm gonna stop here. Sorry to the person doing the slides. He says, he calls out Abba Father. And what does Abba Father mean? Abba Father is an interesting expression uh, because what does it mean for us? It means confident trust and willing obedience. That's what it implies. Saying, calling out Abba Father implies confident trust in the Father and willing obedience in what he's up to. 
Verse seven says this, and now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. What an amazing verse for us to understand that we were once slaves. We were once outside and he invites us in. He adopts us into his family. He calls us his own. We are his own child and we are the heirs to the kingdom. What a beautiful reminder for us. What a gift to us this season that we might choose not to find identity in our accolades. We might not choose to find identity in our connections, in our possessions, in our travel itineraries, what we're able to put under the tree or anything else that's temporary or simply of this world. And the important distinction here for us is that our identity of being a child of God takes me out of the center of my identity. Because when I'm the center of my identity, I am subject to the forces of this world. The things that people tell me are cool. The things and places people tell me I should go. The things that I should be a part of. The things that I should value. And I attach myself to those things. And if I'm not careful, I will find myself with an identity that is completely subject to external forces. And we could find ourselves in a place of feeling tremendous loss when we're no longer able to do those things when our identity is found in a marriage that ends, when we find ourselves a part of something. I think a great example as a youth pastor that I've seen continually is students that play a sport at a really high level. And parents, it's a great thing for your kids to compete in things. But to understand there will be a massive identity crisis if you're not careful. For your student that played hockey or played football or any sport at an unbelievably high level and a, you, everything in your family focused on that, your child playing that sport, getting into those games. That imagine when they spent four or five days a week getting up early, playing a game, and all of a sudden at some point they say, I'm done. There's nowhere else for me to go. I didn't make the NHL. I didn't make the NBA. I didn't make Major League Baseball. All of those things. Is that we push kids into this and their identity gets so wrapped up in their achievements that at some point they might not be able to achieve it. And the danger for us is that we can find this with our work. We can find this with anything that we pursue. That we can pour ourselves so fully into it that it begins to shape who we are. And the problem is, is that we're actually placing our lives in the wrong thing. Being good at sports is not a bad thing. Being successful in work isn't a bad thing. But those aren't who you are. Those aren't who we are. And if you want to experience peace this season, for you to to remove yourself from the pressure, remove yourself from the crucible of success and say, actually, I'm going to trust God as Abba Father. I'm going to confidently trust him. I'm going to willingly obey him. And not only that, I'm going to find myself find who I am and I, everything in my life is going to be informed by my identity that is rooted not in what I've done, but what Christ has done for me and not in what, he, in what other people say about me, but when God says about me to be true. My identity is found in God, not in myself. And you and I are invited into the family of God. In there, we find an identity as a beloved child It is there when our identity is rooted in Christ that we find purpose for our life. That every morning when I'm rooted in Christ at my best and and every day I don't get up and nail this. Every day I get up and, and if I get up and I'm feeling, I know that God is the one, he's the reason, he's what I'm about. It informs the way I go about my day. That I'm able to, we're able to find purpose there. We're able to find freedom there. Freedom from our past. Freedom from our mistakes. That our identity is not a culmination of all the things that I've done wrong. That God's forgiveness for us is truly forgiveness. That he wipes that slate clean when we come to him and we ask him to forgive us. God forgives us and he loves us. We find meaning. That actually finding our identity in Christ means we start to see meaning in things that seem meaningless before. We find forgiveness. Our ability to receive it. And more so, the incredible power bestowed upon us to extend it to other people. We find love. Our greatest need in life is to be forgiven, that we might be in right standing with God. And our greatest desire is to be loved. And God fills that for us too. We've, and here in Christ, our identity firmly rooted in him, we find life and life to the fullest. And the outflow of this, the worship team's gonna start wandering back up here in just a sec, but as the outflow of this, we are able to, I hope, galvanize our identity that might help us fear less. Fear less those that disagree with us. 
that think differently, that live differently than us, but instead offer radical hospitality, to live in the reality of being an adopted child of God, an heir to the kingdom, that with that comes the ability and the status to be able to extend that and invite others into it. That we would offer generosity to people in a way that God lavished it upon us, his children. That we in this season and every season would see the opportunity to extend grace the way God's extended grace to us. That's God's love for us. And I pray that God's love and his message of adoption and his, his identifying you as his would have formed for you and be exuded in the way that you do business, exuded in the way that you interact with your neighbors, that our hope is not in itself. It is in Christ and Christ alone. I was on Twitter about a month ago and I saw a tweet. I just want to share it with you. It, it, it's haunted me in a good way. It was a real simple tweet by this uh, a woman um, from the United States. I don't remember. She, I don't really know what she does, but some, a bunch of people retweeted and I thought it was just so brilliant. She said, person with the question, are you a Christian? And her response was, ask my neighbor. And I feel like people whose identity is rooted in Christ, people who live out a life that are forgiven, live out a life of sons and daughters of the most high, live in such a way that if you want to know if you're, if you're a Christian, your neighbors will be able to tell you by the way that you live, the way that you act, the way that you speak, the way that you treat them with kindness. And my prayer for each of you this Christmas is that we might more fully realize who we are in God, that we are his beloved children, the heirs to the kingdom, nothing more, nothing less. Merry Christmas. Respond with a song of identity.
forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me So bless you. May this week you walk and live in the identity that God has given you. That he offers you to live as a child of the living God.